Okay, now we have arrived here at uh, Stephen Linda Short's house and uh, it's so nice to see you. I met you on Sunday for the first time and uh, I got a really positive vibe and I heard a lot of good things about you. So, uh, so uh, what, what are, you, you, you have this ministry, can you tell me a little bit what you're, what you're doing? You travel around the world? <laughs> yes, um, we do plays that we've written, m musicals about Jesus and now we've progressed to uh, Peter and Paul in in the New Testament that we're we write the plays right from the scripture and we are, I'm a songwriter and uh, my co-writer is a great musician and so he he does all the music for the plays and everything so uh, we tell this we get the gospel message in every play that we do how does people respond to, to a play with the gospel message well, they do, they respond very well. Uh, I'm very pleased with it because I never wanted to do drama. I was a singer and songwriter and that's what, I was very comfortable doing that. And, but God changed it. He had, God's smarter than we are. Uh, I found that out. And uh, he changed my heart about drama because we went to Israel with our dramas. It's against the law to evangelize there, but I could say everything Jesus said, and I could pray for people afterwards, as long as I was wearing a costume. They didn't consider it an evangelistic outreach, they considered it a cultural event. And so uh, we see this everywhere we go, that people have less resistance to what we're doing because we're telling a story. We're telling a story and they get absorbed into the story and they find themselves in the story. And at the end, I give them the opportunity to give their life to Christ. And you see that happen? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. All over the world. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. Uh, even with language barriers, we sometimes do it with interpretation, which is a little taxing on us because we can't just continue our lines and our actions. We have to say a little bit let them interpret and all that. And you would think that that would be a distraction, but uh, we just see that the power of the Holy Spirit is holding their attention through the whole thing. And uh, at the end, God gets results. Yeah. That's good. And you're serving the Lord together, and I think it's just wonderful <laughs> yes. to see. But things used to be slightly different in the past. Uh, yes, I, I say that God has a sense of humor because I was a hopeless drug addict and I was a drug dealer. And God saw fit to clean my life up and put me in a dress and send me around the world telling people about the love of Jesus. And uh, if I was choosing someone to represent my son, it wouldn't be a, a hopeless drug addict. But that's why I think God has a good sense of humor. He takes the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. But how, how, did, did, how did, did you come to Christ? How, how uh, did that happen? Well, uh, I, I was 19 years old. Uh, I guess I could back up a little bit. When I was 16 years old, my father, my stepfather, kicked me out of the house. And the first people that showed me kindness were drug dealers. And... I know now, looking back, that the reason they were showing me kindness and taking me in was so that I could sell their wares on the, on the street and they wouldn't get arrested. Uh, I, that's hindsight, looking at it now. But at that time, I wanted someone to show me kindness and love, and they did. And so I, I became a drug dealer, and I, I sold drugs through high school, and uh, then I... My, well, I came to Florida, I was in California at the time, and I came to Florida because my brother had had an accident where he lost uh, his leg from the knee down, and he needed someone to drive him to New Jersey for the case, which had been kept out of court for seven years. And so I flew to Florida and I got with him and uh, that was really a down point of my life because my brother was hooked on 
morphine and stuff because of losing his leg. And he got me on the needle also while I was here. And so that kind of put me into a spiral downward in my life. And I, I've, I just wasn't happy, you know, with my life anymore. Uh, the drugs weren't fun anymore. And I wanted out, but I didn't know what else to do. And so uh, I, I told my brother, I said, you know, right now everything's going pretty good for us. We're young, we, you know, we're a rolling party, so everybody loves us, you know. I said, but who's going to love a middle-aged man doing this? And he looked at me and he said, Steve, you're kind of young to be thinking about these things. I know now that it was the Holy Spirit touching my heart and making me think about my future and that there was no future in drugs. And so I decided to make one last drug deal. I took everything that I had and I put it into one big, well, it was, it was a conglomeration of purchases, but I, I was gonna make a big score and then retire and maybe open up a legitimate business was my plan. And, uh, and I normally had no problem selling my drugs. I had an apartment in Gainesville, Florida, in a college town. That's where I purchased all my drugs. And then down in Fort Pierce, Florida, where you're going to be this next week, uh, I, that's where I had another house on the river. And I shared it with some, several other drug dealers. And that's where I had a headquarters here to actually do my distribution of my drugs. And I had a very successful business, you might say. And this, this one time that I decided I was going to get out, well, I came back to Fort Pierce. And because my mind was preoccupied with just selling these drugs and getting out of the business, I forgot to put gas in the tank. And so at 2 o'clock in the morning, I pulled in the main road of Fort Pierce, Orange Avenue there that goes right down the center, and I ran out of gas. And the police knew who I was. The FBI had warrants for my arrest. It was not wise to run out of gas, and, you know, especially that time of night. There's nobody on the road but you. And my car was loaded with drugs. But a couple of blocks away, I knew some girls. And so... We pushed the car into their driveway and decided to spend the night there. And uh, it was my brother and a friend named Larry and, and myself. And we, when we went in, uh, I don't know if they gave us a bedroom or something, and, uh, but I was sitting on the bed and Larry's sitting on the bed there. And he looks and he's looking at their books on the shelf and he says, Steve, these girls are witches. Well, I thought, he's crazy. I don't even believe in that stuff, you know? And he said, so what are you talking about? He says, well, look at their books. They had necromancy, uh, the art of witchcraft, how to cast spells. These were the titles of their books. And I thought, oh boy, he could be right. And he said, whatever you do, don't let them get a lock of your hair because they use that to cast spells. I guess he had had some experience with witches. I don't know. And I thought, he has really lost it, you know. And about that time, the girl comes in with a pair of scissors and says, Steve, can I have a lock of your hair? And I said, no. And, and I thought, he, he's right again, you know. <laughs> and, and she said, oh, I can take it from underneath here where no one would see it, you know. I just want it for a souvenir. And I said, no, you're not getting a lock of my hair. And since I was a big, strong man, I locked myself in the bathroom. And that's where I stayed for the rest of the night. And, of course, they were trying to get me out of there, but I wasn't letting them get a lock of my hair. And while I was in that bathroom, I had a vision of Christ being crucified. And I was the one that was swinging the hammer to pound the nails. And so I started to cry. And I, they, they heard me crying in the bathroom and they're banging on the door, said, Let, open the door, what's wrong, what's wrong in there? But I wasn't letting them get a lock of my hair, so I wouldn't unlock the door. Well, the next morning I went out and there was no one there. I figured they had to go find a bathroom. And 
uh, the girls had gone to work and my brother and my friend had gone outside. Well, I went to find them and I knew as I looked out, you know, down Orange Avenue both ways, they weren't on that street. I looked ahead and if they had gone that way, you know, it would have been fine. You know, that's a okay part of town. But behind me is is the part of town where we used to go shoot up and and everything. It's a bad part of town, the drug part of town. And so I said, that's where they went. So I turned and I went down that way and saw a couple of guys on a porch. I said, have you seen uh, two guys that look like me? Because, you know, I had long hair and everything and, and I looked different than most people. And so they said, yes. And I said, well, where are they? And they said, they're in that house on the corner. And I said, did you say in the house? And he said, uh-huh. I thought they found, you know, I thought they found a crack house or a meth lab or something. And, you know, those places are dangerous. And so I went and I knocked on the door. And this really tiny uh, black woman answers the door. And she's real skinny, so I think she's a heroin addict. And she says, praise the Lord, brother. Come on in. And I thought, what in the world did she just say? You know, I wasn't expecting that. And so I said, have you seen my brother and my friend? And she said, oh, yeah. She says, they're in that room at the end of the hall. Well, I'm still thinking this is a heroin addict. And I have some opium, so I figure she's wanting my opium. And I'm looking down this dark hallway, and, I, and there's a couple of doorways, and I'm thinking, she's trying to send me down this hall. Someone's going to, you know, jump me and mug me and take my drugs, right? And so I'm backing down the hall against the wall, and I'm looking in each doorway as I go by. And then when I get to the end, I open the door, and there's my brother and, and my friend, and they're on their knees. They've got their hands raised like this, they're crying and they're smiling at the same time. I said, what is going on here? And she says, these boys is saved. And I didn't know what that meant. And I said, well, get up because we got business to take care of. I had drugs to sell, you know. And so they got up and she handed me a magazine. It was called the Holy Ghost Herald. And it had a picture of an evangelist on the front. And she handed it to me and she said, this man helps boys like you. And she said, and they want to go see him. I said, okay, I'll take them. And so I figured I'd go drop them off. And uh, we got there, it was dark, you know, by the time we got there. I don't know if we knew that you had to wait till evening for this meeting or whatever. But we got to Vero Beach. And... Uh, when I got there, the, there was pitch black. There was there was this revival tent, and but it was just dark. There was no lights on or nothing. And so I went up and I looked inside the tent, and there was no one there, and you couldn't see anything. And then all of a sudden, I heard a generator fire up, and all the lights came on. So I looked back in there again, and there's nobody inside, but. About that time, from behind me, this tall, skinny preacher comes up, and he wraps his arms around me and says, Jesus loves you, son, and so do I. And I didn't know what to do, because I was used to people being mean to me because of my appearance and that I was different than they were. And so I just had no defense against this guy telling me that he loved me and that Jesus loved me, you know? And so... He said, are you coming to the meeting tonight? And I said, uh, no. I said, but my friend and my brother are. And I said, uh, what time is the meeting over? He said, oh, probably around midnight. I said, okay, I'll be back to pick them up later. And so I, I made sure that they were going to the meeting and everything. And I got in my car. And by the time I got from the parking lot to the road, I was crying because I didn't believe in what I was doing anymore. And it, it had affected me what that man said to me. And I, and I said, Lord, if you'll protect me and keep me from getting busted one more time, I'll come to you. See, I had to get my money out of my drugs first. <laughs> and uh, so 
I went and I did what I usually do, and every it was the weirdest night of my life. I could not even give drugs away. Where uh, did you meet Stephen? How, <laughs> how, where, where did you come into? I met him in Fort Pierce, Florida, and uh, it was at a Burger Chef. I'm going to try and tell it a little quicker than I normally would, but. Um, he, he saw, he liked everybody to have fun and have a party, you know, always be up. And he saw me in a car crying. And he did not know me. He just came and got in the car with me and started cheering me up. So that was how I first met him. And then his brother said, oh, you know, go see my brother. He'll turn you on, which is an expression of, you know, give you some drugs. And so that's what happened is, yeah, they became our drug dealers. And, um, but, and I started at a young age. It was um, 11 and a half is when I was with, we hung around with my girlfriend's older sister and her friend. And we were, um, we tried, you know, sniffing Carbona, uh, carpet cleaner, and then we went from that to, you know, marijuana and then LSD. And by the time I was 15 years old, I was not, I didn't even want to do it anymore. I didn't want to do drugs. But, you know, when you, you're doing that and you don't, you don't know any other life, you know, and with peer pressure. I mean, I'd tell my friends, oh, I don't really want to. And they, oh, come on, come on. Because they were getting high, they wanted me to get high. And I would, and I ended up having some bad trips and um, hallucinating, you know, I mean, it was, it, it got bad. I'd see people and it looked like their face was melting off, you know, and I hadn't even taken anything. So this was just from, you know, bad flashbacks and stuff. I couldn't sell any drugs and so I was, I was very upset and depressed because I had all my money in it. And so then... I went back, it, it wasn't quite midnight, so I went back to my apartment, you know, the place on the river there, and I looked, and all the lights were on in the house. And that's not normal for drug people, you know, it's usually dark with black lights and colorful posters, loud music playing, you know. And uh, so I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. And then I. I looked a little closer and I noticed that there were holes in the walls. I could see through the windows that there was holes in the wall. I knew what happened then. The police had come and raided my place and they were looking for the drugs that I had. And the three deal dealers that were living there, I had wholesaled them some opium and they all, they all did 25 years hard time. Uh, I didn't go into the apartment, I was afraid to, so I. I went and I picked up my brother and then we spent the night in the woods. We spent a couple of days in the woods so that we wouldn't be arrested. And then they said they wanted to go to this prayer meeting. And they had found out about it at the meeting that on Tuesday there was going to be a prayer meeting. And so I said, okay, I'll take you there, but then you've got to find your own ride away because I'm going to Lauderdale to unload these drugs. And so. <laughs> uh, we picked up a guy that showed us the way uh, to get there, turn here, turn there, and all that stuff. And then when we got there, I, I realized I had no idea where I was. I said, how am I going to get back out to the highway? And they said, well, come on in. It doesn't last long. And after it's over, we'll show you the way. And I said, okay. And so I went in, and everybody was real friendly. They were hugging me and and just so nice and I thought wow these people are really cool they were like that preacher you know and so uh, I sat down on the floor and there was a lot of people in the room and and I saw and I saw I witnessed something you know that this one person got all excited and was started speaking in another language I didn't understand and the preacher interpreted it and, and then another person did it. And then another, and I'm thinking, well, these poor foreigners, they don't know you're not just supposed to speak up like that. And, you know, and so, and he interpreted for all of them. And I said, 
well, he must work for the UN or something, knowing all these languages, and because they were different languages. And then they all started praying at the same time. And I didn't know what was going on, but, but the presence of God filled that room. And I, all of a sudden I realized I was there for a reason. You need to tell about the, the people that took you in. Yeah. There, there were people at the church there uh, that basically, I guess they knew that we wouldn't make it if they let us go back to our houses or whatever, you know. In fact, I was homeless now, so it didn't matter. And they took me, my brother, and my friend, and I think one other guy, uh, into their home. And that man had been laid off from his job, and he was on unemployment. And he had four children of his own. He set up cots in his living room so that we could sleep there. And we were eating his food and all this. And after about a month, he said, I think you guys need to get a job. And uh, I had never had a job. I'd only sold drugs for a living, so I said, oh, okay. And I went out and got a job. See, and <laughs> I wanted him to mention that because it's so important that new believers um, get discipled. And that was the, the best way that that could have happened. And that kept them. And what we did after that was we went, uh, I had some family land up in Alabama. My mom was living there 40 acres and they had a barn. So my brother and, and his wife and myself moved up there so we could read the Word of God and know for ourselves what the truth was so that nobody could lead us astray. And, and that's what we did. And we got uh, really grounded in the Word of God. I was young, <laughs> very young, and he was a little older, and we weren't dating or anything. But when he and his brother moved back up to Alabama, he would write me letters. And, um, and while he was up there, he told God that he needed a wife. And he said, I was the only one that came to mind. So, and I mean, we had never dated. In fact, he was dating my uh, girlfriend's older sister. And so um, he was like, okay, Lord. He says, well, I can't marry her unless she knows you. And so he ended up coming back to Florida and he did something, and I like to share this, especially at churches, because God told him to cut his hair. He had long hair like he does now, but God told him to cut his hair. And he was like, why God? I know that you don't care about the outward appearance. And I thought that God had told him why, but he didn't. And so he just was obedient. And he went to these girls in Fort Pierce that had cut his hair before and trimmed it and uh, told them to cut it. And they said, you trim it? And he was like, no, cut it all off. And that was, that was hard for him because, you know, well, he had beautiful hair for one thing. But, <laughs> but anyway, so he um, went into that shop. The girls cut his hair off. And I always tell people, I said, I don't know if you've heard this from being from Finland, but there's a saying, telephone, telegraph, and tell a woman. And how <laughs> things get out there if you mm -hmm. tell a woman something. Well, those girls got on the phone, and they called everybody that they knew. And they called um, me and my friends. And so they said, you're not going to believe who was in here and had his hair all cut off. Steve Short. And so God knows girls. And so we went and to, to that tent revival to see Steve Short with his hair cut off. God knows us. He knows the hearts of men. And because of that, we heard the gospel and came to know Jesus. And there were so many of us that, that came. And I said, I can't wait until we get to heaven and find out just how many people from that act of obedience came to know Jesus. So that, I shortened mine <laughs> so, so because he's got quite a testimony, and I do too, but mine is all intertwined with his and how God did that and we got married at a very young age 
but now we've been married, it'll be 44 years this next month. And uh, that's all because of God, because God came into our lives and changed how our destiny, because the way we were going, I, I told people, I know I would have been dead, you know, just the way that my life was going. And so he had another plan. God had another plan. God, God took good care of you, even if, if it probably looked like a uh, like hopeless case yeah. to the people in this world. Oh, yes, absolutely. But, but God, God can do anything. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what, what would you like to say to people who are struggling with drugs and alcohol and they don't know the Lord and uh, they, like, like you said, you, you, you wanted to stop but you couldn't and uh, things like that because I know there are a lot of people out there who are struggling. What, yes. What, what, what would you recommend them to do? Well, <laughs> I would say go to a church, but you can't just say go to a church because not every church preaches the whole message of Jesus Christ. So you have to find, I, you know what? No, just ask God. <laughs> you know, he will, he'll, he'll direct you. If you really have a heart and you are tired of doing the drugs, I've seen so many people, and then when you get to the end, of yourself and don't want to do this anymore you ask God he will come in he'll change your life he'll make it brand new and that and that's one of the things that he says we'll, we'll become a new creation and that is so true because that I mean we were changed and you know like even my family thought oh this is just a phase that she's going through a fad you know now it's lasted 45 years now, so so God is able. He is able to take whatever situation you're in and and touch you and heal your body, just like he healed Steve's body, and take away that desire. And that is one of the greatest things, is when he just takes the desire away and you're made free. So uh, all you out there, God bless you. This is Pontus J. Back from uh, Vero Beach in Florida, and today we have had another wonderful life story. Next week we are going to be back and then we're going to meet actor Gary Bryce from Okeechobee, and he's going to tell about his life in him. So, until then, God bless you all. <laughs>